Good afternoon, everybody. Um, very excited to have this topic because I actually think that it's a positive topic um, and a really great chance for companies as this, you know, not very positive time has has come about and everybody is home. How are companies reflecting on what they've done, reinventing themselves? It's going to be a new world, I think, when we're all back and can be in our offices and can travel again. And um, this is a really great chance for companies to take a step back and think about how they're doing things. And those that do it well are going to really um, be ahead of the curve. So I want to, uh, before passing it over to Brian Landerman and Tom Godden of AWS, just very quickly thank our um, tech and innovation community sponsors, AWS, Google, InterSystems, MIT Professional Education and Progress. Their support um, is why we're able to pivot and do these things. Um, and be, before we pivoted, you know, they were there to support us as we could do online events. I mean, excuse me, uh, in-person events. Um, I also want to thank our global sponsors here who, without their support throughout the year, we wouldn't um, be able to do anything that we do. So it means a lot to us, particularly in these times, to have the community come together, share insights, get connected, continue that trusted network. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see everybody else. And I am going to turn it over to Brian and Tom. Thanks, Sarah. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Um, our, our goal for this is to really have a conversation. Um, Tom and I have um, some content about kind of what we're seeing, um, some observations and some opportunities and, and that sort of thing. And so we'll, we'll definitely share those. But we'd love for you to engage with us um, along the way. Um, so I'm Brian Landerman. I'm on the AWS Enterprise Strategy Team, and we're a team of former CIOs and CTOs that all led large-scale migrations of our company's infrastructure to AWS. Um, so with AWS, we we meet with customers and and we talk about not only our journey, but um, but also you know having met with over 2,000 customers a, a year, our our team sees lots of lots of folks. Um, taking different approaches to to transforming their organization and adopting cloud and, and that sort of thing and so we, we uh, bring that experience to bear to help customers um, in their own transformation so prior to joining aws uh, last february i was the chief technology officer at, at cox automotive um, and cox automotive provides all sorts of solutions um, largely to automotive dealers working with um, automotive manufacturers as well, but everything from autotrader.com, kbb.com, 60% of dealership websites, to also the kind of in-store operational systems. So, um, you know, a big producer of, of software that was adopted by, by car dealers. Um, Tom, do you wanna provide your bio? Yeah, so uh, this is Tom Godden, and uh, thank you guys for joining us here today. As Brian mentioned, uh, I'm also on the enterprise strategy team at AWS and, and excited to spend a little bit of time with you. Prior to joining AWS about six months ago, I was the chief information officer for Foundation Medicine in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I led them over a four year period in a transformation of moving from on-prem waterfall based organization to a completely cloud based organization running in an agile DevOps model for an FDA class three regulated device. And as Brian mentioned, we spend a lot of time engaging with customers and learning from them and sharing with them various different best practices that we see occurring uh, across the industry. So we're kind of excited to get a chance to spend a little bit of time with you guys today on a topic that I'm sure many of us did not expect that we would be talking about. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, I mean, so like like many of you um, at Amazon, we've been working remotely for um, several weeks now, and and really cutting back on travel um, to the point of it it kind of stopping last week or the week before. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important to recognize that it, it this is a challenging time for all of us. Um, you know, we're seeing many businesses being seriously affected by social distancing, distancing from you know restaurants and bars. Um, to banks, hotels, airlines, buses, uh, cruise ships, right? You, you name it. 
Um, we've seen everything from governors signing new orders where uh, restaurants are now able to sell alcohol with, with food orders to go or, or um, for delivery. Um, newspapers stopping um, printing, you know, and, and laying off staff to an attempt to weather the pandemic. Um, and we saw this week, uh, we were chatting at the at the top of this, that O'Reilly canceled all their future um, in-person conferences and, and shut down their event portion of the business. So um, by no means are we ignoring the fact that this is, is taking a meaningful toll on all of us. Um, but the conversation we wanted to have today was really about um, the positive things that are that are happening and and some of the things that we're seeing that um, we feel like, as Sarah said, will have a lasting effect on on how we interact and 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 how we do business. Um, and so, you know, in addition to those things, we're, we're seeing a lot of businesses changing how they operate, um, you know, to support the world and in, in fighting this virus. Yeah, and, and as part of that, there's a variety of steps that Amazon is taking to help our customers and community during this time. I'm sure many of you have heard that Amazon has begun prioritizing its inventory to make sure that critical items are available for customers and allowing people who are shopping online to be able to get that, those um, products and, and those materials. We're also trying to improve the uh, safety for our associates and have changed our logistics processes to make sure that uh, they have additional measures during this time to make sure that uh, our customers and our associates have increased degrees of safety. We've also done some exciting things within AWS where we launched the Diagnostic Development Initiative. It's a program that is really bringing together customers and providing them a platform to perform more accurate um, improved diagnostic solutions and trying to help them bring them to market and collaborate faster as they look for solutions not only to COVID-19 but to other diseases. Additionally, Amazon has committed an initial investment of $20 million to help that diagnostic research um, be conducted on the AWS platform. Amazon has also established a relief fund, about $25 million of an initial contribution it's focused on helping our delivery solution providers who are under financial duress during this time and also includes a donation of $1 million within the Washington DC area and a $5 million donation within the Seattle area that's really trying to help the businesses, the small businesses in that area that have been impacted, including Amazon has gone forward to continue to pay all of their hourly staff who were the service providers in the offices that are now closed, um, you know, within uh, all of our Amazon regions to help them bridge through this time. Now, we're not alone in doing this. We're certainly doing our part. And I know that many other organizations are doing theirs as well. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the question is really about, you know, so how is this going to affect the industry um, and society going forward? Um, and so we wanted to start that conversation with just a set of observations, things that we're seeing um, take place that is, um, I don't want to say abnormal, but, but, you know, largely building on kind of um, the platforms and technology we have, have access to. Um, and so, again, we'd, we'd love for, for you to contribute. Um, we're really looking to get the conversation going and, and so would love your, your observations as we go forward. Um, but I think, you know, in general, the good news with all of this, right? I mean, we can see, you know, with, with folks on this call that we're all in this together. We're all figuring this out. Sarah was saying at the beginning, it's, you know, depending on who's on a call in her household, she's switching different rooms. Um, you know, I had to tell my, my kids to, to not scream and, and whatever before we join this call. Like we're, we are all figuring this out. And, and I think um, it provides a very unique opportunity for us because um, while, while it is, it is um, new and, and can be awkward, um, there is a lot of opportunity to experiment. And, and I think people are largely very forgiving. You know, there's lots of jokes about people, um, you know, um, commenting on those that are, are still wearing jeans and button downs and whatever and like, because you know you want to you want to wear your sweatshirts like nobody really cares um, and and so I think that that provides a, a really great opportunity for us and so we'll, we'll talk a bit about that but one of the first observations that I wanted to share was um, 
with music. So I, I've seen a growing um, trend in where uh, musicians and and, um, and bands are are sharing their music on Facebook Live, on Instagram Live, on YouTube. Um, I've seen them uh, using Venmo and PayPal to to get you know don donations, essentially payment for the concert. Um, some some also doing free streaming. Um, so you know Garth Brooks and his wife Trisha Yearwood um, did a free concert. Um, kind of broke the internet, as they say, uh, you know, Facebook Live was was challenged by that. And so, um, so that's really interesting to see, you know, Facebook having to respond to this, this, um, you know, growth and in, in demand kind of out of nowhere. Um, but, but so Garth Brooks and, and Trisha Year were doing that. Metallica is streaming a complete concert series um, every Monday now on YouTube and Facebook. They're calling it Metallica Monday. Um, so they're taking a show that they've done in the past and, and streaming it for free to their, um, to their fans. Um, DJ D Nice um, is hosting what he's calling Instagram Live Dance Parties um, or Club Quarantine, and and has attracted you know Michelle Obama, Ellen DeGeneres, Oprah, and others to um, for for different reasons. With Michelle Obama, is really to drive voter registration, but but doing it from from the house and and really trying to get folks engaged. Um, I recently saw a, a new Facebook group on um, it's called Share Your Streaming Show Here. And so thousands of shows are getting shared. I saw one recently of, of Hosier partnering with um, the WHO um, to do a, a free concert. And then, and then the last um, thing I'll share is on this one is um, Verizon is launching a Pay It Forward Live. So they're doing a weekly series of top acts performing at home, starting with Dave Matthews. Um, and they've committed $2.5 million to local initiative support uh, corporation, which is a nonprofit helping local businesses. So a lot of a lot of things going on where um, the good news is they're leveraging existing technology platforms, but they're coming to you from their house, from their you know the couch in their apartment, from their basement, and and you can see you know Garth Brooks is in a sweatshirt. Um, it's it's a lot less formal and and more intimate. Um, they're taking requests right using these live platforms, and so um, I really I can see this lasting for sure. Um, I think you see a lot of artists. You know they're fully committed to um, to touring with their band or to their their labels and um, and there isn't a lot of time to go and book kind of separate shows. But if you could sit on your couch and get folks to come and and watch, um, you know I could see experimentation for for new materials. I could see kind of like you know your side gig. Hey, let's get together in the basement and stream a concert. You know, and we'll take donations on Venmo. So I think this is this is just the beginning. It's not necessarily new streaming music um, live, but the, the rate of adoption and and um, and I think from from both artists and fans I think we'll see this continue for sure. We have a question. So uh, Stephen, Connell, Stephen Connolly, it says, "Are you seeing some of these virtual events getting promoted in individual businesses as a new form of workplace activities?" We are. So I think the challenge from a, a workplace perspective is that the the pivot is is somewhat significant. <clears throat> Um, you know, I think if from whether it was O'Reilly or, you know, AWS, we've canceled a lot of events. We're pivoting those events to virtual events. And, and so I think um, the, the big challenge in that and taking, you know, what would be a full day conference with, you know, different tracks and that sort of thing, um, it, helping people navigate that in a virtual world, making sure the content is, is, is relevant and engaging in a different format. I think that's that's the the, the challenge. Um, making sure that uh, we have the technology in place to do so um, is is another thing. So we've um, yes, I think that is that is the trend, and I and I I think there's a, a great opportunity for us to um, get a lot better at that very quickly. This is going to force us to do that, and so I think we'll we will see an uptick in that um, in that format. Um, but that kind of leads me to another observation, which is that the um, you know, whether it's, it's video podcasts or, or podcasts in general, um, you know, that's another thing that we're seeing folks, you know, uh, do in a, let's say, makeshift kind of format. I've, I've seen some of the AWS evangelists um, doing, you know, edu kind of low level, like 101 kind of level education on, on what is cloud computing. And, um, and I've seen folks like, you know, 12 year olds and that sort of thing, picking up those, those videos and following along. And so, there's a there's a great opportunity to just experiment to just put content out there to um, 
to feel free to do so. And, and so we're, we're seeing that happen. Um, you know, our team's looking to increase podcasts um, and to just create some content that folks can engage with on their time. Um, you know, because I think it's, it's important for all of us to have, um, to find new ways to stay engaged, to find new ways to, to um, make space to learn and think and, um, and, and separate ourselves since we're really not allowed to, to leave our home. So um, I think that's a, a really great opportunity. Um, and so, so one more that I think, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, and I'm just going to interject. So Tom, Brian, and I talked about this yesterday and Mass TLC is going through this. We can't just take events that were designed to be in-person events and that have multiple tracks or breakouts or they're designed for connections. They're designed just as you would if you, you know, if you were going to see exhibitors, those are all designed for in-person experiences. And this part of rethinking and reinventing and redesigning is all, how do you create, and I'm looking at Brian Tom to totally answer this question for everybody right now. How do you- We have it all figured out. <laughs> exactly. How do you recreate an in-person experience that can't be in-person anymore? And, you know, as we discussed, and Tom and I were talking about this a little bit uh, b before, the, before the show, which is how do you, how do you look at what your bottom line is and how it was impacted and then say, all right, well, when this is all over, I'm going to actually continue down this path of figuring out how to create in-person experiences when people aren't in person. Yeah. Well, so, I, right, I think that from a technology perspective and how you do that, because I think one of the things like today, we want this to be um, not just Tom and I talking. Um, it, that can feel unnatural and, and awkward, right, to be put on the spot and to have to engage. So I think we have to figure out, uh, we all have to kind of learn that and, and get comfortable with that. And um, But ultimately, we, that is the environment that we need to create in these virtual engagements, not just somebody talking to you um that i think that you know that format can work um you know but i think we, we need to create these in, engaging um interactions but to your point sarah i, I mean we, we aws spends millions and millions of dollars on events right on industry events on our our own summits and reinvent and it's a significant amount of money to get people together um, and I'm not, I'm not going to say that those things are going to go away, but I, I think it'll be really interesting. You know, we've almost over indexed on, on that in the tech, tech community of, of having to go to these events as a, as a way to engage with people and to learn. Um, I could very, very well see this, you know, creating a new trend in, um, in virtual events. You know, maybe you're jumping between rooms where, you know, you could have one vendor. You know, like if you think about the vendor floors of some of these summits, um, you know, one vendor in each room and you join a meeting and now you can talk to the people there and, and you know, join a conversation or um, that sort of thing. So I think I think it'll be really interesting to see, you know, what comes out of that. Going back to your comment about uh, music, I've seen musicians who um, this was both pop and orchestra who um, are around the world and they each played their part and then it was sequenced together as a singular performance. Um, uh, the Wait uh, by Bob Dylan just turned 50 years old and um, Robbie Robertson was the one who led it and it was amazing to watch on YouTube and the other was wow. a Canadian orchestra and I was just fascinated. So I so so I can see yep. what you mean by jumping from vendor to vendor at a um, trade show. Yeah, right. It's that's that's so awesome. Um, what a, I mean, what a unique way to create music and collaborate, right? Um, definitely hadn't heard of that. I'll have to look that up. Well, as another interesting point is, I I wonder if companies are going to start to look at you know these musicians that are doing all these cool things. And trying to mimic them for themselves. Yeah, I think that, that that's an interesting thing, and I think we're seeing a couple major, uh, you know, things, macro events that are going on in in the industry. In particular, there's a lot going on in the gig economy services, both positive and negative. 
you know, Uber's CEO just came out and said that they are down about 60% in the last week overall compared to uh, the same period in 2019. So there's certainly a, a lot that's going on to shake that out. But there's also some really interesting things that are going on. You know, Instacart and Peapot are seeing an absolute boom in grocery, you know, delivery. You know, Instacart came out and said that they're seeing uh, an, an increase in sales that's 10 times higher than the previous week. And in some states like California and Washington, it's 20 times higher. You know, like many of you, I my, my mom's in her late 70s. I spent some time on the phone with her last week, walking her through how to place an order on an online grocery and to get groceries delivered to her so that she can remain safe as, as she lives many different states away, you know, from where I currently am. And I think we're seeing a lot of those changes um, occurring. We're seeing how those um, organizations, Instacart, Postmates, Grubhub are creating you know, that no contact delivery. I think we're going to see a surge of adoption in usage of those gig economy type companies where people are compelled to really use them for the first time. I think in addition to that, I think we're gonna see that there's gonna be an increased adoption of some digital products and means of working. You know, it's interesting to see, you know, certainly food delivery and, and product delivery you know, are, are evolving, but telemedicine is a really interesting element and I'm sure many of you have tracked what's occurring in the news, you know, the drive to bring telemedicine to the forefront of healthcare and in some cases really shape it. For those of you not deep into telemedicine, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges around telemedicine is unfortunately been around how you get paid. Um, and, you know, with recent, uh, you know, um, developments, 18 states have enacted new regulation that change how doctors are able to collaborate with patients and establish a relationship with that patient, not only for payment, but to manage from a legal ethical standpoint, um, a relationship with that patient. So I think we're seeing a surge of those activities, including in Massachusetts, which is often a laggard in telemedicine, Charlie Baker, Governor Baker, just announced uh, um, an order that is forcing all commercial insurers, you know, to cover all of the telemedicine. Likewise, you're seeing that with COVID-19, the governor of Massachusetts also announced that building permits will no longer be reviewed in person, but will solely be done online. I think we're gonna see a continuation of the move from some of those more manual analog-based processes to these digital platforms. And I think as long as well in conjunction with that, we're gonna see a shift in expectations for people who utilize them are gonna become more and more comfortable with them. The holdouts, the laggards are going to really desire to move more to those digital services. And I think it's gonna be incumbent upon us as technologists to find a way to deliver them. You know, another one to share with you guys interestingly is, is contactless payments. We're all talking about social distancing and, and how we can be safe. You know, social distancing is, is bringing about a surge in electronic payments, whether it's Venmo, Apple Pay, Google Pay, others. Um, you know, by, you know uh, Jody Kelly, uh, the CEO of um, the Electronic uh, Payment Association came out and said, you know, and I think rightly so, People default to what's familiar until something jolts you out of it. Well, we're all being jolted right now. You know, contactless payments are really getting that drive, you know, before, um, you know, COVID-19. The United States really wasn't using, amazingly, contactless payments, even though we all carry a smartphone. Um, you know, there were companies that began to be early adopters of contact payments, Whole Foods, Panera, Target, Best Buy, but there's others that are still holdouts, Walmart being one of them. But in the United States, people have not been using contactless payments. In China, 80% of the people in China who have a mobile phone have used their mobile phone to make a payment at a point of sale in the last year. In the United States, it's 10%. But we're seeing a significant surge in development into that. And I think we're gonna continue to see it. But more importantly, 
I think we're going to see heightened expectations from our customers on bringing about an even more seamless and simpler customer experience as they get used to having these embedded um, solutions at their point of consumption, at their point of interaction. Yeah, so does anyone else have any other observations that they'd like to share? Uh, much, small, much smaller scale than global concerts. I'll turn my camera on here so you guys can see me too. Nothing really worth looking at. But um, So I work for a company up in Tewksbury called Time Trade, and we do online appointment setting for organizations. Uh, some of them you've heard of, like Sephora or PNC Bank and Best Buy. Um, and appointments, I think, were, were always part of a nice-to-have for businesses so they can sort of manage their uh, customer experience. Um, but now we're really seeing an influx from banks and credit unions um, yeah. really trying to manage the safety of their employees um, as well as their customers because they're only really seeing um, opportunities for certain amounts of staff being in the branch uh, if the branch is open at all. Uh, and they can't have, you know, queues of, of customers and clients waiting in the branch um, because that proposes or presents a, a risk opportunity just for the customers and for the staff. So we're trying desperately to try to see if we can make our products more portable, easier to install, um, so that customers can manage their interactions with safety in mind for their clients and, and their um, their customers. So it's definitely having uh, an impact on our business, but unlike a lot of other businesses, um, we're seeing a lot of customers and prospects come to our door asking us for help. Um, so. We're happy to see if we can get them, you know, some solution quickly. But it's certainly made for some uh, interesting conversations internally of how, how we can fast track a product path for them, um, not just from a software perspective, but from a contracting perspective and you know, dealing with personal information and all that stuff. So usually a process that takes, uh, you know, six to eight weeks, depending upon how vigorous uh, hosting operations and security folks are, um, can take a very short amount of time now. And I will say we are hosted on AWS, so thank you guys for making sure that you're up and running. Awesome. Uh, that, that's yeah, actually I mean, a that's... great example, one, one that I hadn't yeah. thought of, but you're right, not only from a personal safety standpoint, but from a convenience standpoint. It'd be interesting to see how, as you heighten people's expectations of that, that, that plays even farther. So that's a great one. Yeah, it's very interesting for, for our space right now. Um, especially with banks, we work a lot with wealth management companies. Um, you know, Charles Schwab is, is a customer and you can imagine you've got people dealing with health crises in the face of a wildly fluctuating stock market. So um, these institutions are having to deal with, you know, the, the care of their internal employees while certainly trying to manage the expectations from customers who have questions about not just the stock market, but, you know, how much cash do I need? You know, if I'm only going to be able to go to the shopping market to pick up groceries once a week, now cash becomes a concern because um, you want to make sure that, you know, you've got the ability to pay for things if the systems are down or what have you. So um, not to mention, you know, when another historical event, um, you know, mortgages are at an all-time low <laughs> in terms of rates. So people are looking to refinance. You've got uh, thousands of people sitting at home with nothing better to do than to look at what the mortgage rates are right so now they've got opportunity to refinance um and uh, because of the stimulus package there's going to be a significant influx on small business credit um, and just trying to see if people can get small business loans passed to help bootstrap their business and keep them in operation so all of these have to be done with you know making sure they get to the right person at the right location whether it's virtual or in a branch um, and people just don't want to you know, flood the branch with with inbound customers because, as I said, from a staff perspective and from a, um, a client perspective, it just presents a health risk. <laughs> yeah, I I think those are some great examples, and I I love the opportunity to fast track, right? Um, and and kind of rethink the existing processes. Um, I would love to see that. Uh, you know, like in your business. Um, take shape and and stick right how that, that would be fantastic if you could um, use this as an opportunity to make meaningful change in your business 
Um, does anyone else have any other observations they want to share before we move on to a different topic? Yeah, if I could just jump in. Um, you know, my company, uh, Locked In, we're involved in uh, a lot of HR and employee benefit consulting. And so, Tom, your point was well taken about telehealth. Um, you know, for years we've, we've been seeing it just kind of lag behind where we would well, like it to be. And uh, some of the things that are that are market driven, um, as well as regulatory driven, you know, uh, physicians were not allowed to practice across state lines in telehealth uh, until just very recently. So some of these things are actually being being driven by uh, by uh, kind of crisis regulation. But uh, <clears throat> we also deal a lot with our clients in human resources, and they're right on the front lines of this uh, crisis as well, because it's really a human crisis, right? It's not a financial crisis. Um, you know, the, the financial and economic crises are really stemming from this, this pandemic, which is a human crisis. And so, um, you know, we're seeing our, our partners in HR being uh, involved in conversations across their businesses. And I think it's an opportunity for uh, folks inside of those organizations dealing with people, dealing with talent to really uh, elevate their participation in their, in their businesses going forward. So um, just, just my observations. Yeah, I'll chime in. This is Gates. I'm, at, I'm actually with an AWS partner and uh, we focus, uh, I call it business transformation because we do all the soft stuff you know, the process consulting and the uh, change management kind of consulting. And we've got a decent focus on healthcare. So what's interesting is um, the, the telehealth is gonna accelerate obviously, but there's a book that's coming out. I think it's in the final reviews right now. And it's it's a book that was based upon another book written 15 years ago. It was called, the book was called Smart Sourcing. And uh, what happened is someone in the healthcare industry, an executive at uh, Optum, reached out to the writer and said, hey, we should look at smart sourcing from a healthcare perspective, right? So, so the reason I point that out is, is because telehealth, yes, it's gonna be accepted more. There's some innovation happening, great little hospital, uh, South Shore here, in, uh, it's called South Shore Health Systems, doing incredible innovation for a small independent hospital. So I think this is gonna, what's happening right now is gonna drive the telehealth acceptance, but it's, you know, people gotta look at, you know, other resources to get a mindset around change but i'll call it um organized change not chaotic change right you know uh looking at existing processes looking at impact of change on employees and customers overall but the net net of this thing is 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 while it's a tough situation there there could be some good things come out of it on the other side especially in the healthcare so and you know and amazon has been an unbelievable catalyst to change for years now so it's you know it's great uh, to see you guys on the call that's it. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think I think what what you all have pointed out are some great observations, but also great opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, uh, this this here today is a is a good example of an opportunity where we're we're experimenting and um, and trying new things in in this format. i um, you know doing what what might have been done typically in a um, at a dinner or you know in a room and 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 going around and having conversations, you know we're 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 trying that here and and um, seeing how it works. And so I think there's there's lots of opportunities that we have in front of us. Yeah, and although I think we would all much rather have our teams together and and have business continuing as usual, we we all know it's just not possible right now. And as Brian mentioned, I think it's it's a great opportunity to look at how this creates advantages and, and opportunities for us as well. And, and one that I'm certainly interested in, and, and we've had a lot of traction from our customers around is using this as an excellent time to really take advantage of updating their training or, or obtaining new certifications. You know, Amazon is part of their COVID-19 response has provided some new capabilities around training. You can now take all of your AWS certification exams online with online proctoring. So you can take all of them and get your certifications online. You can find out more at aws.com forward slash certification. And there was a great uh, event held about a week ago called Awesome Day, AWS um, OME Day, awesome, you get the play on words, 
which really was focused on providing people a lot more training around cloud fundamentals. It's a free course. It's another one that's been made available online that people can utilize some of this time and, and maybe some of the time that we used to be stuck in traffic, which I know none of you guys, if you live in the Boston area, know anything about being stuck in traffic. Um, if we don't have to do that now, um, maybe we could use a little bit of that time that we used to be commuting to learn something new, whether it's us or our team. So certainly a great opportunity that maybe we want to bubble us by. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a great point, Tom. Both kind of um, an opportunity for for your your teams, your organization to to take advantage of of this time to um, to learn. There's certainly more space to do so, um, you know. But also personally, um, I'm I'm using the time to tackle some some of the things that I've wanted to do that I'm you know haven't necessarily had the time. So Tom and I travel a lot. Um, you know, a lot of our work is in-person events or or in-person customer meetings and um that that travel you know takes time and and is, is impactful in in terms of our ability to get some work done so i'm i'm personally taking this time to you know i want to go do some courses on machine learning i'm uh going to build some things for our team using using aws tools to to do some reporting and, and create some insights and that sort of thing so i do i do agree i think it's a, a great opportunity that we should all be taking advantage of um, I think another another opportunity is um, sharing. So I don't know about you all, but I'm really actually until I came in this role, I'm not a big blogger. I'm not a big social media person. Like I'll, I'm on social media, but I'm not sharing everything that I'm doing at every second. And you know that's that's just not me. Um, but uh, I think we kind of we this is a great opportunity to start again getting comfortable with the things that might feel awkward um so you know and and that can be both internally and externally i think um you know whether it's blogging podcasts you know video logs panels like this i think there's a big opportunity to to share in new ways to connect people in new ways um and do it in in a way that they can consume on their own time so um I, you know, I, I think that's a, a big opportunity to, to connect and, and, and explore new things with your teams. Um, also to connect with your, you know, your customers. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly doing that here. I mentioned podcasts earlier. Um, but, you know, Tom and I are, are, are looking for opportunities to, you know, create content that, you know, our customers would benefit from or, or our teams. Um, and so that's kind of another thing that we're doing with this, this newfound space. Yeah, you know, as Brian mentioned, we find ourselves, uh, you know, on, on airplanes quite a bit. And, and I've spent the, the better part of the last 20 years of my career in a variety of different circumstances, you know, working remote. But I've been working remote with a lot of people who have been in offices. And, and, you know, an interesting side effect with all of us working remote is it's really a great equalizer. I think we're all becoming better at working remote, you know, becoming more tolerant and, and more effective. You know, some of these are the soft skill things, guys, but the things that I think we'll look back on and, and be able to appreciate, you know, previously the group that was in the room back at the uh, office at the headquarters had all the power and the person, if they were working remotely and they struggled, well, tough, because people probably didn't have a sense of appreciation of what it was going to be like. But, you know, now with everyone working from home, I think we're all getting better at the behavior norms and the routines and how to make sure people feel included in, in really, you know, um, being effective. You know, I'm sure, again, we would all rather that we had come across this learning in a different way, but this common shared experience is really, I think, helping us and will help bring us together. I'm interested from your guys' perspective on what other ways that you guys are seeing as, as opportunities to take advantage of this time, to be creative, to explore what your teams are being able to do. Does anyone have any any topics? Uh, and we, we're doing a lot of collaboration rollout type of things, accelerated type of things. You know, you got to look at the governance before you just roll things out, and you got to look at adoption. But if you can accelerate companies in in doing that, and then there's vendors, you know, technologies um, out there that are, that are being provided, you know, at no charge for even for a six month period. Like I just saw RSA has multi-factor authentication, something right. 
So there's opportunities. It's a question because you know, like I said, this time people have now theoretically. Hopefully they're they're researching some of these things because there's technologies out there that can really give some of these smaller businesses, mid-sized businesses, acceleration from a technology adoption perspective. So the, the, I wanted to ask Amazon. This is interesting because I found I, get, I came across a drone company. All right, Amazon is king of supply chain and <laughs> in, in the drones. What 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 about the impact of drones now with this? I mean, that's going to be short circumvented regulations around you know that because that's going to be a way to deliver things in the future. All right. So have you guys seen a lot of stuff around that? I actually saw a little bit of discussion on that on on the thread, and I think it was a little bit more in lines with what you're saying, which was speculative of wondering if this may bring a bar, uh, a part an impetus to make people more comfortable with drone based or autonomous, you know, uh, type of, of delivery. Um, and I don't think that we know yet. I, I think that uh, the pressure hasn't got to that point to really bring that about based upon what I've seen. But I will also tell you, I don't necessarily sit in those rooms at Amazon. It's a big company. Maybe there's more conversation going, but I haven't heard it. Yeah, same. Any other topics or, or things that people are using now as an opportunity with them, uh, with your teams or with yourself to explore? We're obviously using these platforms to do team meetings and, you know, uh, touch points. And we, we, we come pretty close to requiring use of the camera. Um, I've got a face for radio, so it's a little hard for me. But uh, <laughs> You and me uh, both. Uh, but, you know, again, it, it's part of trying to figure out this human connection through this technology, right? And I think uh, it also gives insight into, into people, you know, I'm sure everybody looks at, oh, what's in your background? And, you know, are you wearing a headset or not? Or, you know, what are you wearing? You know, I think that's, that's part of being human, right? Um, so one of the things that we're thinking about is uh, uh, I we have a, a local website and I've done some podcasting, which is great, but we were thinking about actually taking um, a team meeting uh, of a handful of us and just kind of just, you know, almost having a discussion around how they're adopting to this new framework of work, uh, what clients are working on, and then put it out as a, you know, not as a podcast, but as a blog cast. I don't, I'm not even sure that is, and just seeing what kind of reaction there is, in the, you know, to people about that. I, I would imagine people would be more inclined to look at uh, uh, a video recording than they would be to listen to a podcast. I, I don't know. Just I actually, to answer that question from Massey, I, I um, <clears throat> talk to all of my tech. I think it depends upon your audience. So this was a big question I had for my tech and engineering community, which is who's presenting this today. And they were much more inclined to want a podcast. And Brian and Tom and I talked about this yesterday. And it's because you can multitask with a podcast. It's because if you need to get out of your house and go for a walk, you can listen to a podcast. But if you are required to have a screen, then you're tethered to your computer. And one thing that I found with people working remote right now, is they're on their screens a lot more, so any break you can give them, still giving them something to think about, still giving them something to get engaged with, but not having to look at a screen has been something that people have asked. So that's that's just from the Mass TLC community, um, but it's from the tech. The tech. Um, I wonder if there's a, is there a technical way, I'm, sh I'm sure there is, to, to toggle, to give people the option, hey, if you want to watch it, click this button, or if you just want to listen to it, go over here. And it's the same content. It's just one is consumed, you know, vi through video and audio, and the other is just audio. And, I don't I'd also like to see, like... oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Stevie. Didn't mean to step on you guys there. No, go for it. I've also been waiting to see, um, you know, companies like WeWork, there are an awful lot of people working from home and their kids are all home. And it would seem to me that, you know, since Starbucks isn't available, um, you know, a real a, trying to see if there's attractive options to get people to just to, you know, get out of the house if they can work independently at like a WeWork location, keep, you know, uh, contact to a minimum, obviously, but see if there's a way to promote those sorts of capabilities. And I know 
I've got a small team that I manage in a, in, in a product team, and they run the gamut from you know early twenties to um, you know later fifties, and they all have different life cycles with kids, right? So some of them have uh, are empty nesters, some don't have kids, but I know the ones that have um, school age children in, in grammar school, especially, are are challenged right now, especially if you have a uh, two folks at home that are, are, are working from home now. Um, so I'd, I'd love to be able to see something like that happen where, you know, there's there's some place to go that's not critically expensive, um, that you can still feel safe to, to get some work done for a couple of hours. Yeah, I just thought of something else, and this might apply to Stephen too in your in your role. So, so our company, we're not a product company with services, but one thing we've done, we started last week, is we had a, a one hour over lunch call in session, and it, it wasn't us presenting; it was people calling in. We're experts in this area. Please call in with your questions, right? And we had such a great uptick for that that we put in, we're doing another one this Friday. So you schedule something yeah. out like like Stephen's company, Time Trade. You guys basically just set up a thing every week or an hour. You'd be surprised at the value that comes out of that because it's not just us answering questions it's also other people on the call it's all kind of like an open source community you're sharing ideas as to how to maximize your use of this technology or that technology so that's that's an thing i haven't seen done a lot and i think you know there's an opportunity to make you know that more you know, so you basically get technical support best practices out to your users in an easier fashion right with less planning theoretically you just get on there and answer questions so we've seen hey, that I am, pretty well. I am writing a message uh, internally as we speak to. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Yeah, I mean, look, I think I think you're right. I think this, there's a great opportunity to experiment. And um, because we're all in this together, uh, you know, there's also kind of space to fail and not get it right because every, I, I think people are more forgiving right now. And so um, we should fully embrace experimentation and you know, I think one of the things that's helping us at Amazon is uh, is our our culture. So we have a strong culture, and um, you know that's backed by our leadership principles, and they're providing guardrails for us, um, you know, and 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 ways for us to still, you know, through our like PR FAQ process, quickly define ideas and and move them forward, um, and strengthen those ideas through collaboration. Like that's an existing process for us, one that we can leverage even though we're not in the same location anymore or bias for action one of our leadership principles is is reminding us to you know in this time like let's not be frozen right um we can we can move quickly and and we have a mental model that we use um which is two way one way and two way doors you know one way doors being big decisions that have you know significant financial or or you know whatever sorts of impacts if we were to if they were to be the wrong decision versus a two-way door hey we can we can go down this path we can take we can do this experiment and if it doesn't work out no problem we can we can go you know go back through the door and and, and rethink our approach and um so i think that that really allows us to set a foundation of experimentation but i think not all cultures are that way um and and so i think you know we can certainly use this as an opportunity to um, to, to kind of build that in. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, maybe I'll, I'll leave you guys in, in closing a, a little bit of a story, you know, necessity being the mother of invention, but maybe also out of the ashes, the phoenix rises, a little bit of a story. If you remember in 2017, uh, for those of you who maybe have heard the story of the Danish shipping company Maersk, was struck with a ransomware virus, the NoPetya virus. Interestingly, even though it was a ransomware virus, the people that infected Maersk forgot to come up with a way to ask them for money. So it wound up not necessarily being a ransomware as much as just a malware, which somehow makes it worse. Um, but ultimately what happened is the entire company got infected with the malware. And it brought this entire 90,000 person company to halt. And if you don't know Maersk, Maersk basically is the backbone of shipping globally. And if Maersk stops moving, the ramifications would be enormous. They had infected over 4,000 servers and 45,000 PCs locked at the boot up screen because of this virus. They were completely frozen. Interestingly, and if you read their stories, there's some great stories on, on what happened. They were completely offline because their Active Directory also got corrupted. They had all the permissions for all their systems, 
across the entire company. But luckily, their regional office in Ghana had a power outage. And so they were not infected with the virus because they were offline when the virus started propagating. So they had to scramble, get someone to Ghana, tell them to not boot the servers when the power came back on. Um, otherwise, it would become infected. And they pulled the server offline and, and used that to be able to replicate all the permissions from their Active Directory and, and got things back up and running and completely rebuilt the organization over about a two-week period. But another really interesting thing that happened during that time for Maris, born out of necessity, there was no corporate email, there was no messaging, because it was all infected. So what happened was people went and signed up for WhatsApp. And they, you know, the, the privacy people can go nuts, but in the time, necessity and time, people will self-organize, and that's what they did. They created groups to work on solving specific problems. And when you're in an urgent time of need, you only invite the people that are critical that you need to solve the problem to the group. And the HR department at Maersk, and there's been some fascinating studies on this, actually spent some time um, reviewing and trying to understand what groups formed, why did they form, and who was in them. And they actually rebuilt the organization around a lot of those self-deterministic groups that were built out of this time of need. So although I know we would all rather not be going through this, and we all want to get to the other side of this and be safe and healthy and have all of our friends and family be that, some interesting things could be born out of this and, and we could ultimately grow out of this. And, and you know, Maersk is certainly an example um, of a company that went through something very similar. Yeah, that's a great story, Tom. So. Um, look, I think it's it's important for us to remain connected and, and to have space to, to think and explore ideas, as I said, and, and step away from our normal work. Um, so, you know, Tom and I would, would love to thank you for, for taking time out of your, your busy schedule and, and figuring out this uh, chaotic time. Um, and and to let you know that, you know, we're here to, to certainly um, to help you out if, if from an AWS perspective, from a, a you know, kind of transformation perspective. Um, perspective where we, we talk a lot about agile and devops and, and and cloud and how to make that work in different organizational structures and that sort of thing so if we can be of help feel free to uh to reach out to us to connect with us on linkedin and um and we can go from there and and lastly uh sarah thank you so much for having us and, and matt dlc for setting this up we, we really appreciate it yeah and th thank you all and tom and brian thank you because i actually think this is one of the more positive conversations we've had directly responding to COVID-19 and everything that we've gone through. Um, as I mentioned, this is, this is the way we are testing is going to be put out there um, more as a podcast than a video. And we know that it's gonna be here hopefully for all of us to go back and listen to and, and listen um, to some of the ideas that were talked about. But for all the people that couldn't make it, um, which I think is something else that we're seeing is the availability of information um, to have it there 24 seven as people's schedules allow. So I wanna thank you all for being part of that and a little bit of our history as we, um, as we put this online and, and allow others to come and listen as well. So with that, thank you so much. It's, it's been a great hour, um, really positive. And I am looking forward to, to more positivity here. And again, thank you to our sponsors. Um, thank you to our globals. And thank you to all of our members. Enjoy your Thanks day. Everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. You too.